if you didn't meet the minimum 70% threshold of attendance. So it's important to do that. Today, we shall be talking about something very interesting, very exciting to many of us. Uh, we, uh, we, are, we are in the digital economy. And uh, we want to look at the, the business opportunities in the area of emerging digital economy. It might be digital economy. How many of you? Hello? Are you getting going? OK. Now, uh, we, can, we don't have the luxury of time to be talking too much. Uh, we are already starting it. And I would like to invite our special guest lecturer for, for this session to the high table uh, to come and uh, eh? So why is she standing to be recognized? Let me just tell you uh, briefly about that. This is Mrs. Miss Abimbola Miss Weekly, right? Abimbola Weekly. Miss Abimbola is, is the head of investment and technology promotion for Africa of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. Under this technology in a National investment policy, national trade policy, and FMCG policy. Mrs. Abibola is the founder of the African Child Safety Foundation, advocating for <laughs> advocating for sufficient food and clean water for minority children around Nigeria. Earlier in her career at Power Africa, the United States Agency for International Development. Program. She has worked in the private sector for 17 years and the following companies, Long Badger, Baker Hughes, Total Energy, and Shell Nigeria Exploration and Production Company. Abimbola holds a degree in physics from the University of Ibada, Nigeria, an MBA from Warwick Business School, University of Warwick. UK. Supply and logistics from the main university, Germany. <laughs> and uh, an executive degree from the Lagos Business School in Nigeria. <laughs> Besides being fluent in English, she also speaks Hausa, Yoruba, and French. We brought the people that we know uh, meet our specifications. I'm sure you are going to have a nice time in this lecture, listening to her. 
at the end of the day, whatever you are able to understand uh, will be put to test that you have to uh, submit to the center. So let me now hand over the microphone to her so that she can comment on this session. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Sonara, for the good introduction. I appreciate it. It's good morning. I hope you can all hear me. I'm happy to be here this morning with all of you. It's good to see a full room. And um, one thing I'll just ask of you is to pay attention because I'm going to try to make this as exciting as possible. So trust me. My intent today is not to bore you, but to give you an exciting experience as we talk about the digital economy and the opportunities for entrepreneurship in this area of focus. Because I want to believe that by the time we're done today, we're going to be having from this room alone, probably a hundred unicorns that will be making a million dollar mark in their business by the time you're graduating from uni or even before. So can I just see your hand up if you're interested in learning about digital economy? <laughs> I'm not seeing enough hands up. Should I go back? What's, what's <laughs> Okay, I want to see hands and bright faces as well. Good morning. And I think we can just get started. So in order to bore you, can, can we go to the URL please? and have the video play. I just want to juggle your mind a bit with the video. And I hope it does resonate with everybody on just, you know, the rat race that we're all in. Okay, so um, the audio is bad. So it says, does this sound familiar? It's 6 a.m. in the morning, your alarm goes up, it's about to snooze it again. You, you drag yourself out of bed, dreading the day and the week ahead. After stumbling into the shower, putting on the dreaded suit and tie, you glance at the mirror, heavy feelings of resignation sets in. You quickly devour your convenient breakfast and you jump into traffic. You sit in the peak of um, the traffic jam, you get to walk, you're trying to get coffee to just keep yourself away. And this is what you're supposed to keep up for probably the next 20 to 30 years of your career. It's a trap. You can't quit, you have bills to pay, you have to pay your rent, you have to like, buy a car, you have to pay, to your pay school fees, and you're dying inside. At the end of the day, you sit in traffic again, bumper to bumper, and you finally arrive home. You have just enough energy to sit in your couch and then drag yourself to bed, right? So this is just the story that the video is, is telling you. And before you know it, you are awake again. The alarm clock is just the vicious rush race that we're all in because of the regular brick and mortar attitude that we have to work. And so many people are in this the same old routine every day. Nobody is, you know, hitting the lottery from working. There's never a time where they say that you need to jack up because you came to work consecutively for five years. So the, the crux of this is that we live in an information age now, right? You can stop the video. I think the message is, is ended. 
We live in an information age where we need to escape the brick and mortar. We need to escape the industrial age and how things are being done. That means we need to start to work in the way that is different from what we know. Work now doesn't entail having to wake up in the morning, get in your car, drive to a particular location, sit there for eight hours and you go back home. You can work from the comfort of your home. You can start to unlock value, right, from the comfort of your home. And you need to get into a mindset that is um, value, that the mindset that says that whatever it is that you see in life, as long as it holds value, it also holds capacity for scale. And you can scale that through the technology that you have in your hand, just from the mobile device that we all hold in our hands every day and probably predominantly we spend media, you can actually channel that time and energy into developing new ideas, creating, ideating, pivoting, whatever it is that you've ideated and scaling and testing the market accessibility of your solutions. This is what advantage the digital economy has brought to you. So I'd like to let you know that as long as you're sitting in this room today within whatever age range that you're in, you're blessed to be born into this age where you actually have the platforms that you can use to, um, that you can commercialize to make yourself, you know, some very, very good money. And there is no idea there's no current solution that exists. Think about what Elon Musk has done. Think about Mark Zuckerberg. Think about Facebook in itself. Everything that you see today, everything that currently exists, holds the potential for skill because you can think about what something else that you can add to that that becomes value that can be monetized. And that is what the digital economy is all about. So we're going to get into um, we're going to get into just a simple definition of the digital economy and also that an overview of the course. So the simple definition of the digital economy is just using digital platforms to change how traditional brick and mortar economic activities are being transformed by the internet by the World Wide Web and blockchain technologies. In addition to that, we have artificial intelligence, we have augmented reality. You are going into the slides, we're not there yet. We have augmented reality and we now have um, even apps that are being developed that can actually mimic the emotions of human beings. We have robotics being developed, and all these things are not things that we should be thinking of as if they are far from us, but they are things that currently exist. They are tools that you have in your hand. If you have a phone in your hand, you are empowered already, so you need to start using the tools that are available to you to ensure that you are making the best of the opportunities you have. And this is what um, digital economy is all about. So, for the course outline, our course as introduced by Prof is business opportunity in emerging digital economies. Hello? The emerging digital economy Paul's significant prospect for will be technopreneurs to unlock novel business areas for profitable investments. The innovation and entrepreneurial promises of ongoing digital re revolution, such as artificial intelligence, internet of things, and other others are immense but hardly recognizable to ordinary eyes. This lecture will guide you into unraveling new business opportunities. This that come uh, with.
the objective of preparing you to take turns and the advantages of these new realities. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's your world and it is your opportunity. So, uh, um, before we start the course, congratulations. And before we start the course, I'm getting 10% of your businesses about the opportunities that exist. So, let's um, go into it. Does anybody have any question at this point? based on what I have said so far. We'll move on. Okay. So business opportunities in the digitally transformed world. This is about by Open SAP, and it will interest you to know that there are courses that you can use to buttress your learning that are on open apps, you know, on the internet that are accessible at all times to people and you can learn from. So what does that mean? I don't have to sit down and create new lecture notes because I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Whatever it is that I need you to learn and I'm teaching you, I can leverage what somebody else has done and adapt it to our current realities in Nigeria. So let's go to, into the first slide. And no, next one, please. Next. So this one, it's a 2020 reality check. And this particular slide was, um, was quite eye-opening. So during the 2015 course in OpenSAP, they had predicted that by 2020, there will be two billion people connected. Uh, uh, and the projection also said 30 billion people will be connected through devices. So connected devices, there will be 30 billion. And cloud would witness probably a growth of about 2.9 billion. Or cloud grew back from 2.9 billion in 2012 to 32 billion in 2020. These were the projections just seven years ago. When... 2020 came three years ago, the reality check was done. And guess what? Not 2 billion people, but 3.5 billion people were connected. 30 billion devices indeed were connected. So that was spot on. And the global cloud market grew by 62 billion. That is the quantum of increase that has been experienced. It's astronomical growth when you look at cloud and everything going on to the cloud. And the growth rate is approximately 20%. You have another projection for 2025, and we're currently two years away from that, for 4.4 billion social media, people on social media, and 42 to 75 billion connected devices. So that is like double of what we're currently seeing. And looking at the astronomical growth based on the projections of 2015, it is very clear that the opportunity in this space is massive. So if I'm throwing around the figures and it is not chilling together, I will give you real life examples. When we talk about, um, uh, let's say, When we talk about, right, has anybody here ever bought anything on Instagram that arrived at your door? If you have bought something on Instagram and it got to you, let me see your hand raise. Like if you do, if, if Instagram is your marketplace, now hand is up, right? Normally I will wake up in the morning and I will go to the market because I'm trying to buy an orange t-shirt. But what do I do today? And this is the same for a lot of people, right? Is you first of all check your online market. You will order it. You will look at the delivery uh, time specified. And you will see if that delivery time meets what you're trying to achieve. If it's going to be delivered same day, you're fine. If it's not going to be delivered same day, you may worry and you may think, let me go into the market to do this. 
But these are the regular activities where you have to get up, go to a market, find what you want after going on probably five rows in the market, searching for it, and you buy it and you get home. Now you sit in the comfort of your home or wherever you are. There may be people in class right now buying something on Instagram, right? You just sit down, you, you, you find it, you look at the size um, chart, it aligns with what you want, you pick your t-shirt, you pay for it, and you just wait for that call from that delivery man that is saying, I'm looking for your address or I'm in front of your date, and boom, your um, commodity is in front of you. Now, if you think about that and you're thinking, okay, that's t-shirts, there's so many people selling t-shirts on Instagram and everything, do you realize that that is because when it comes to device penetration for Nigeria, Yeah, it's just if you so if you're looking at that in Nigeria, where 200 million people plus of Nigerians have mobile devices. So can you think of when 50 percent of Nigerians have mobile devices and how currently what we have in the market is not sufficient to service the 50 million people that have access to the digital economy. These are the things that you need to start thinking about to say, what can I do? That person selling food on Instagram and supplying you, you seated in this room, at least 20 people in this room, and take a look at that value chain and add value. It could be that, what can I do? Somebody is already doing the cooking. I don't know how to cook. I don't know delivery people. I don't know anything. But one person can decide, you know what, when I prepare my food that is delivered to me, I'm always worried around, was it done in a hygienic manner? How did they cook this food? Was it tampered with by the delivery person? You know, you start to think, and the minute you start to think, that is your mind working. That is your mind saying, there is capacity for growth in this value chain. You can decide now to go by yourself, you call five friends, and you say, we're going to take 1,000 companies on Instagram selling food. We're going to go and inspect their facility and see how that food is being cooked. And then we're going to start certifying that it's done under the right uh, condition. The kitchen is clean. You know, the utensils are clean. They cover their hair when they are cooking the food. And then guess what? You realize you come back to Instagram and people are only patronizing on the people that you are validating and verifying as hygienic providers are getting more patronage than the regular people. So so let's use so verified by University of Abuja. Anybody Let me try this one. If you know there's a problem, you know, word of mouth is the biggest advertisement. Word of mouth is the biggest advertisement. If at all there's a problem, they will say it's because it's not verified. Verified by who? So when you go on to places like Amazon, for example, to, to look at what it put that trading platform compared to the popular Kijiji, um, is it Kiji and Chumia and um, there's an Akonga, right? For Nigeria, you start to see that there is room for articulated reviews. The owners of Chumia may not be able to articulate reviews. You can sit down, go online, find out how to articulate reviews, go to Jumia and say, instead of you spending a million dollars on a getting review, can get you for next to nothing, if for each review that you get that is realistic, you pay me 10 cents, and then you get several reviews and you're making money, 
And guess what? This, all these things are being run on what? Apps. They are being done on your phone. You, have, you don't even need to get out of bed. To generate this type of very fact about the digital economy and it's there's nothing that has come so as the digital economy that has hold such uh, such magnitude of opportunities for anybody anybody as long as you have access to the infrastructure the platform as well as you have the entrepreneurship skills to to do it so next slide please When we're looking at the digital economy, we're looking at it from perspective. We're looking at it from a perspective of resilience, profitability, and sustainability, and it is akin to a ball with an interior. Next slide, please. So when you look at it from the perspective of resilience, the outer coating of your ball, let's just call that your ball of opportunity in your hand. The outer coating is resilience and it is characterized by, you know, for, for it. so the, the outer coat is resilience and then the inner coat, the inner core is your profitability and your sustainability. So just assume that this is your business idea. When you have that business idea, you have to think about it as a ball. That ball has to have sustainability, it has to have profitability, and it has to be resilient. Next slide. So the slide. So in terms of resilience, the ingredients, the ingredients for a resilient outer skin for any business in the the digital economy, a, a customer focus. The business has to be customer centric. If you are not focusing on your customer, you can't do it. So, like I said, this is not the regular brick and mortar where you can bake bread a thousand loaves, put it in the shop and people just come and buy. It's finite, they buy the thousand loaves, you're done, you close shop, you pay your staff, you go home. When you're using digital economy, it means some people will tell you that I like the bread, but I don't like it as brown as you bake it. Guess what, you begin to condition. So it's almost like economy with empathy because you are recognizing the specific needs of people and you are able to meet it because you have a platform that can actually collect preference, that can collect feedback, that can collect choices, that can create options. That's what the digital economy does for you. So it is, it has to be customer centric. It has to, you know, meet with the external factors. So it has to mitigate all risks that are coming from external factors, it has to leverage collection and networks. So if you are doing anything with the digital economy, network is key. You have to key into a particular network. What network are you in? Sometimes your solutions might first of all be showcased on the WhatsApp groups that you're in. If the class has a WhatsApp group, for example, and you're trying to create a solution, that would help students. I'm sure your first audience will be your class WhatsApp group and you will say, please share it on other networks. So networks are critical to getting the resilience that you need. Then your innovation, when you talk about innovation, and adaptability, and it begins to, answer questions and create solutions to problems. At every point in time as an entrepreneur, you need to sit in a solution space and you always have to ask why and how. Every time you sit anywhere and you are observing something that you really appreciate and your brain goes but, that but, whatever comes after, that is your opportunity because that is the 
additional value that you are not seeing and that you can create and add to that. So when you go to the airport and there are issues, maybe you fly the best airline, it's on time, everything is fine, and you're just doing a mental appraisal of your experience and your brain goes, what? That what? Stop right there, hold your thoughts. If you can, write it down. That is an opportunity to pitch in front of investors that can make you money. Even more money than the airline. So sometimes it might just be, I have traveled, I, I flew in from Lagos last night and I'm like, you buy regular economy tickets and you buy the business class tickets in Nigeria. When you do the same, when you're flying abroad, regular economy class tickets, you would go in and you know, board your flight without a lot of assistance. But when you buy the business class, especially when you buy from maybe the Arab Airlines or Virgin Atlantic, you get VIP treatments. And I said, so when you buy local tickets and people pay three times the economy price, why don't they get anything extra? Why should I pay three times the price just to sit in a bigger chair for 50 minutes? It doesn't make any sense. But if that price now incorporates, that's how much it is to, to pay for the lounge at the airport. It's 3,000 Naira. I think with the devaluation of the Naira, it has now become 5,000 Naira. But how does somebody, how can an airline justify taking 120,000 for one seat and you can't just use 3,000 out of that to say, when you buy this ticket, your ticket allows you entry into the lounge where you can just have a bottle of Coke at the maximum, that is at the worst case scenario, 500 Naira. It's not too much to us. But nobody is looking at it. But the, the latest airline now is what? Value Jet. As you meet one person from here now, after this class, says to Value Jet, Value Jet, please allow me. I can go and negotiate with all the lounges in all the airports that you fly to, probably predominantly Abuja, Utakot, Lagos. And I will negotiate and say any passenger can come and use this lounge for 2,000 naira. And you can serve them either a cup of tea, coffee, or one bottle of coke, not more than that. And based on that, you can change your seat configuration from 10 business class seats to 20 business class seats because I can assure you that you'll get patronage for it. Do you know it will happen? People would actually buy more because the way the human mind thinks, and that comes to custom being customer-centric in your solutions when you're being in the solution space. You have to understand how the human mind thinks. Somebody would give a thousand naira for a box of granite just because he thinks he's getting value. The same person for a full meal will not pay that one thousand naira because he feels, I'm not getting any value. People have been rude to me and everything. And the young child might be able to sell something to that same person the same amount, but because of how you made the person feel, he's ready to part with that money because he's, to the human mind, it is a value exchange. To the human mind, it is a value exchange. It's never about the price. Anybody, you, you, you realize in your life that you are ready to pay for something if your mind processes it as good value or better value, you all go to tailors that will make your clothes. The one that delivers on time, pays you, you know, will charge you more and you are ready to pay. His work might not be as good. Everybody has that tailor that is like, you know what, he goes very well, but he's always delayed and he's cheaper. And you will never go back to your cheaper tailor. And you're ready to pay mediocre, a mediocre tailor a higher fee because it's delivering on time. Because what constitutes value to you is the, the timeliness. You just want to get your clothes on time. You don't really care now. The perfection of the sewing is secondary. So with data, and this is where big data comes in, you are able to capture all these because 
when you are trading digitally, when you are doing business digitally, there's an avenue for, for people to tell you exactly how they feel about the transaction. And when they tell you how they feel about the transactions, there are algorithms that are running behind to look at that feedback to understand what exactly does value mean to your customer. When you know what value means to your customer, then you start to make money, then you start to pivot, then you start to create new things. Like if you were baking bread before and somebody says, I want my bread to be brown, you might start thinking, maybe this guy wants a kind of cake, something between cake and bread. Before you know it, you change the mix, you start making that, you find that oh, by but it's because you are able, when you do that in a regular store, people buy, they go. When you do that online, you get to understand the mind of your consumers. So the digital economy isn't ordinary. It is the future. It's not just do this, the routine, buy, sell, get my money, reinvest it, buy, sell again. But at every point in time, you are expanding you are iterating your solution to ensure that it is continuously meeting the goal and you are being competitive. Because if you are not doing that, a competition would come and just clear your market in one day just because they are doing something else based on their analysis of feedback that has constituted value to the customer and they are meeting that and they're not even doing it as much as you can. So today, when you go to the airport, it's not about the beauty of the plane. It's about timeliness. I don't want to sit at the airport for more than two hours because of my flights, right? How are people getting to do this? And why do you see that today you have new airlines coming up? This is the reason why. So um, if we look at it in another context, Every value chain that exists holds an opportunity for a new entrepreneur and a new solution and a new businessman. As basic as potatoes, selling, buying and selling of potatoes, you ask yourself, when people buy potatoes, what do they do with it? They will peel it or they will first of all wash it maybe because it comes in a basket, they sound, stand around it and everything. And then they will peel it and they will, you might want to say what exactly, after peeling it, what are they doing with it? Now with digital economy and just in this space, don't have to start with the digital, you have to start with the thought process. That thought process will help you to create value that people need but right now, as we're all sitting in this room, they don't even realize that they need it. When it comes to potatoes, I want to buy potatoes. But right now, I want to buy peeled potatoes, sliced potatoes that I can just take from the bag, put it in the, in the oil, fry it and eat, right? I don't want to have to wash, I don't want to have to do anything. But when you see potatoes in the market, they're still, there's no markets that you go to and you see potatoes that are still not in their skin. And being Nigerian, our consumption mannerism is very important. So as entrepreneurs, you can't just be thinking of, let me make profit. No, you have to go through the whole length of the, of that. I call it, you have to walk the day with any product. A, a piece of potato, a piece of tomato, a piece of carrot sitting in the market. What is the journey of that product to consumption? It's a farm to market journey. You have to take that journey with that commodity to understand where you can add value. So we'll come back to the potato. The potato comes from the farm and then sits in the market with the women as one whole potato unpeeled. What happens? You sell some, the rest go rotten. Probably the woman, her children eat potatoes every other day because she needs to save potatoes from getting rotten. And she's buying potatoes, probably she, she wants to sell one sack a day and one sack is 20,000 naira. And at the point when she gets to 
maybe 25,000 naira in sales, she will just consume the rest, go back to the market and buy again. And she's making a profit margin that's not up to 10,000 naira in a day, if at all. And I'm being very optimistic with my uh, um, example. This same woman can sit down, pay another woman 1,000 naira, peel all the potatoes, wash it, use her phone to call her customers because she has asked them, what do you want from, what are you doing with your potato? Should I give you your potato peeled and washed or are you frying it for your children? And she can take for the processing of that potato, for that one bag, she can sell it at a value of 50,000 Naira. And she has paid the 1,000 Naira to peel and to cut, right? She can use her phone. She doesn't need to wait for customers to come. And what do customers do when they're standing in front of you? Just to eat chiniki, they will start pricing. That's how they start to test off. 1,000 Naira, 200 Naira, and then you go back and forth. Nobody should have time to be sitting in the markets in the Nigeria of today if we allow development to take place. No woman should be sitting in the market waiting to sell a product that is less than $100 in the Nigeria of today. She should be able to think, and if she's not thinking, you, 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 and you should be off taking from all of them to say, give me all the produce. I will take them. I will employ people. They will peel it. They will make it ready because we have people or we have stores that are waiting for these finished products. We have to elevate our value chains above the primitive level of, you know, mechanism that it is right now. Therein lies an opportunity in agriculture, one product. Show tomatoes get to no. Today, everywhere in the world, nobody talks about in-season and out-of-season agricultural produce. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like tomato is in season. There's nothing like agalumo is in season. There's nothing like that. Right? Why? Preservation, processing value addition to existing value chains, to existing value chains. All over the world as well, talking about clothing, there's really nobody saying, I'm going to the tailor to take this. I have a wedding, I'm going to tailor. Why? Standardization, right? And quality determination. So quality metrics, you have to have a quality infrastructure. To have that quality infrastructure, as now, is an overlay of digital economy on a market that is so large and so real for us as Nigerians. Everybody has a tailor that makes something. If you go to every tailor and you tell them, let me help you to get standardized Nigerian sizes, we all go online, they will tell you, are you US 10, UK 4, uh, Europe this? Why? Are we like them? Is our shape the same? Why can't we have our own Nigerian standard measurements? Do you understand? And one size doesn't have to be absolute. One size can have variations. You can be size 14, upper, upper 14, lower 16. And that is yours. And everybody, do you understand? You can fit into that one standard. Primary school children don't have to be, you know, appearing like they're going to prison in their uniforms because one person in this room can decide that I'm going to tackle this for government if it has to be a government, um, a government structured contract. Let me show all the uniforms. We all know. So there's something about society that is that we're not tapping into. And I need to just choke your minds to tap into it. There are a lot of things that are certainties. There are certainties. We go from certainties 
we use our certainties to solve uncertain problems, right? So this is me going into my physics world. I'd say in the solution space, what can you do to add value? In every solution space, a reduction of uncertainty is a value addition. So for us, we'll go back to the primary school example. We know all the schools in Arangwagwalada, yes or no? If we don't know, we can drive around and find out. If we don't know, we can decide that in this Abuja, we're going to enumerate and get what? 50 schools. We're going to say for this school, they wear this uniform. In this school, there are X number of children. In this school, that's what data collection. The data you collect informs your solution that you will provide to them, yes? Are you, are you here? Yes, <laughs> I'm asking that. <laughs> so it informs it, and then you decide what uniforms do they wear. Chances are that maybe of all these 100 schools, 80 of the schools wear the same color of khaki in skirts, trousers, or shorts, right? Or they may wear the same color. It could be green, it could be blue, but there's something that is similar across board. And then maybe they have print that just has the name of the school that is different on the shirts. And you can decide, you know what? Rather than them, everybody going to sew their own, I want to start producing 5,000 shorts in brown khaki and letting people know this is where in the market, everybody will come and they will not be saying, are you looking for khaki, this color to buy, to then take to tailor or to go and sew. You are, the traders are your off-takers and what are they selling? Khaki shorts, brown color, like you will find in other times. This is how it works. Why are we not doing it? What they know is also what we can know if we go and gather the data. So for you to thrive in the, in the world of digital economy, you have to go and gather the data in your area of interest, or even if you are not interested and it just blows at you, you're like, okay, you know what? Let's gather data, let's do some fact finding. Based on the data that you have gathered, you start to create your solution. I was talking to Prof this morning and I showed him my hand fan. How many of us have hand fans? How many of us have hand fans? Hand fan is very important in life. After getting money from ATM machine, I think hand fan comes second for some people, because they might just take light, but the lecture continues. Maybe the generator may carry the mic only and the systems that we're using to project and everybody else is seated in heat. At every point in time during the day, because we are in the tropics, we get what? We get to use a fan, either manually or we went to that wedding yesterday and the souvenir is hand fan. You can dash out every other thing that they have or you, you will collect the, the battery operated fan. 10 years ago, those same souvenirs, what did they contain? Plastic fan made by Dana. Dana is an Indian man in Nigeria, by the way. The water you drink, the airline, the plastics, our pockets, by an Indian man, right? Those fans, even the concept of the hand fan itself, guess where it's coming from? Any guess? It's coming from China. Do you know what the temperature is there? They don't have heat, too. There's no heat in China. It's very cold, but they sit in China and China is saturated in terms of solution, but not just because they are saturated in terms of solution to advance the economy, they think outside the box. So a lot of the things that we use today are what products 
from students in universities and schools, colleges of technology in China. Guess what? Africans are sweating. They need fun. They create the fun. They send it here, we buy it. How many Nigerian firms make fans that you know? If anybody knows anyone, I'll be happy to hear it. And the Gaza, yes, good. Why should there be only one? Are we not the ones that are hot? For China, you will see a thousand different products from China that are answering to our needs. Richard Ebola. Everybody has one. <laughs> Everybody has rechargeable lamp, right? Everybody has something that is battery operated or the other. And these kids are sitting down miles, thousands of miles away, creating something every day that you yourself, as you're sitting down here, you don't know you will need it until you see it. That's when you will buy it and be like, ah, ah. whoever knew that battery operated hand fans will come. We were happy just finding ourselves with data plastic fan and the Eleganza plastic things. And then you saw battery operated. Initially, you, you, then they started creating even the ones that is like, okay, you know what? Some of them are complaining that the batteries run down and they need to recharge. They then changed them to, instead of using double A batteries, we started using rechargeable batteries. Then because of the complaints, they started making the small miniature fans as USBs. With USB, you can plug it to another source. Because as they are making that one, they're also creating power bank for you to buy from them, China still. And then we wonder why Naira is dropping. Then after that, it's like, ha, let's just put one small solar panel. Thanks for, the, for that tip that you gave me. One small solar panel on this one. That's why you start seeing rechargeable lamp, put it outside during the day, bring it out inside at night, and voila, you can listen. It even has radio, it has rechargeable the lamp, and plus a fan. Do you understand? Before you know it now, when they say, see that Nigerian children, they have said it is by force that they should learn how to sing on computer. The next rechargeable fans will be coming. It will be teaching children how to sing as part of the module. What are they using to do all this? Digital info, information is digital. They, some of the people producing these things have never been to Africa, but they know about it because they have gathered enough information to help them to keep iterating the solutions. And those solutions continue to meet your need. And it's not just the need, existing needs that they are meeting. You just go to the market and you're like, what is this? Oh my God, oh, this will be really, really important for me, right? And then you pick it up and off you go. When you went to the market that day or when you went to the supermarket, you had no inkling that you were going to have such a need or buy such a product. But you see it, it speaks to you, you take it, off you go. And guess what you start doing? You tell 10 other people that will go and buy it. Are they advertising hand fans in Nigeria? They are not. This is the power of being consumer centric through gathered information. And this is the kind of power it holds for entrepreneurs. As entrepreneurs, what is the next best solution to the hand fan? Somebody in this room might be able to create it. But if I tell you what is the next best solution to the issues that they are having in China, where everybody almost on a daily basis still has to wear a mask, and there are inconveniences around the wearing of that mask, people have reported allergies, what can we do about it? If I give that challenge to this class, we will come up with something, but I think 50% of us will be like, what is my own problem with China? I have not solved my problem in Nigeria. But then they are not thinking like that. We are their problem. You know why? Solution is the highest selling uh, commodity on any exchange market. 
solutions. Life is all about solutions. You have to sit down and think as an entrepreneur, what it means to be an entrepreneur is that you're a problem solver. You look at the problem, you find a, a solution to it, you get somebody to pay you for it. You look at the problem, there's no solution for it. You have to find a solution to that low solution. That is how to exit as an entrepreneur. If your solution or whatever it is you're selling is not solving the fundamental problem, you won't make profit. You will be spending on advertisements. Do you need to do advertisements? You don't need to do advertisements if you focus your solutions on solving basic needs. I went to, uh, I went to an exhibition and I saw people, I met someone from, I think it's Pata. They came to the exhibition. I took an interest because it was, uh, it's called um, Hanover Messi. It holds in Germany every year. And it is the biggest manufacturing exhibition globally. No, so when you, when you enter into a manufacturing exhibition, you are expecting to see machinery and air stand. So I went to speak with, had nothing. They had nothing. The guy just had a small laptop like this on his, like a pole. All white, here exhibiting, and the same company. I said, when you hear mobility, what are you expecting to see? They're expecting to see cars or tricycles or something. And they said, no, we don't operate like that. That's so we are solving the problem of mobility through digitalization. I sat down there, please explain to me. So they said, so what we do is we study traffic. We do not believe in building new infrastructure. Roads exist, cars exist, everything else exists. Bicycles, tricycles, everything. What doesn't exist is a management system to manage the mobility, to deliver what is to the people. Because guess what the commodity is this time around? The ease of movement. That is what people want. You know, there's this movie that says, what do women want? And the guy, you know, in his brain, you can actually see exactly what it is. As entrepreneurs, you need to be in a position where you're asking yourself on a daily basis, what do people want? The people that go to the markets, they want to eat. And that is a fundamental want. After that, Bearing all obvious things like the food, what do they want? They want to cook it. To eat means you have to cook. After cooking, you will serve it. It has to be enough. Then you not start saying, did I even eat a balanced diet? If I eat rice in the morning, bread in the afternoon. Then you start. So you see that what people want is really different. So somebody can actually come and say, Come and buy this basket, weekend basket. It has protein, it has fat, it has carbohydrate, it has everything. All of a sudden, you see every student saying, me, I've gotten my weekend basket too. I'm not even worrying about whether my food is balanced or not. By the time I finish eating all that thing in that basket, it is balanced. Through what? Gathering of data. Through what? Focusing on the customer. So the digital economy has come to a stage where it's not just the regular thing that happens. You're not saying preferences. How many of you have heard about the chat GPT? So the chat GPT is here. Guess what it's doing? Because you can tell chat GPT what to do and it will actually write an essay for you, right? Students, it's also been reported that students are using it to pass exams. 
and they are now looking for regulations around chat GPT that will make for equality and no, you know, um, cheating in systems. But then I read an article yesterday where they said chat GPT, you can tell chat GPT what to do as long as it is artificial intelligence based, it's fine. But chat GPT doesn't have empathy and cannot do things based on preferences. So I, I, I said something to my son on chat GPT and you know robotics and you know the whole world of the digital economy and artificial intelligence. You now have washing machines with built-in artificial intelligence. They wash your clothes. When you're done washing the clothes, when the soap is running out, they can go online and order new soap that would arrive in the mail, you know, and you don't have to worry about anything. But then regulators are now worried that these apps are only buying the same brands all the time. So there are some brands that are positioning to be the first choice for the space, right? In the digital economy, because everybody is like, so why does a blue uh, elephant do the target instead of oh, it's not <laughs> right? So and then they now said they have to go and upgrade the apps. And they are upgrading the apps to do what? To begin to think and say, wait, what is my experience watching? 